gonna be a bit of a rant video. It's kind of what I do nowadays about the Blackmagic Pixis 6K. Now I'm gonna talk a lot of shit about this camera, but my beef isn't necessarily with the camera. It has more to do with like the hype train, the insane <laughs> craziness that you'll see on YouTube. People telling you that this is somehow revolutionary, game-changing, sell all your cameras, whatever. YouTube is getting a little out of control. I obviously have no problem with people making videos about cameras on YouTube. But there's a difference between an informational video uh, about a new product or about an old product, whatever, telling you what it does, what it doesn't do, what it's good for, etc. And I'm sure that a lot of these videos that have insane clickbaity thumbnails and titles, when you actually get into the content of the video, that's probably what they are. The hype is getting crazy because this is literally not a new camera. There is nothing new about this camera. It doesn't do anything that is innovative or technologically superior to anything that has been on the market for a while. The only thing new about this camera is the form factor. Same camera as was released last year, the 6K full frame. I believe it's got the same sensor or a variation of the same sensor that's been in use since about 2018. And I'll get into the reasons for that. Feel free to disagree get angry, whatever you need to do with yourself. If you if this camera fits into your workflow and if it suits your needs and is something that could really help you, then by all means buy it. I have no problem with Blackmagic design, but if you are looking to buy a new camera or you somehow find yourself feeling like you need to get this camera because of the breathless hype, um, then don't. You know, don't fall into that trap. And there's a, a bunch of other alternatives out there that might be better suited to you. And also we'll just kind of talk about like Blackmagic has sort of a long history of really dumb design decisions and this camera is definitely no different. So let's start there. Let's start about, let's start off with like why this camera is kind of stupid. And the number one thing is probably the obvious reason is that it has this massive fixed LCD monitor to the side. It's fixed to the side of the camera. Never seen anything like that. I know there's been plenty of cameras that have LCD displays on the side of the camera. It's sort of like a cinema camera thing. It's for like the camera assistant uh, to be able to change settings. Uh, they're touting this in the marketing material that it would be perfect for a, a follow focus operator to be able to look at the, the screen from the side. Um, okay, fine, sure, whatever. So let me back up a little bit. This is the same camera, right, as the 6K full frame. People, I think, have, have rightfully gotten a little bit disenchanted with the the design of the pocket cameras as they've gotten bigger, as they've iterated and added more features and, you know, gotten bigger sensors, whatever. The form factor has just, it's always been a little bit ridiculous and it only got more so as they got bigger and bigger. They finally dropped the pocket but uh, from the last camera, but it's still the same as the pocket 6K Pro, same design. I understand the reasoning that people were clamoring for a box style camera because that design stopped really making sense. A lot of people are going to counter that they're going to put an external monitor onto this camera. That's sort of the whole, th the reason you have a box camera is to build it out to suit your needs. Why put a four inch 1080p HDR capable 1500 nit brightness <laughs> monitor on the side of the camera? You know, like the Komodo for instance has a, a full color LCD on the top of it, but it's not, it's not big. I don't think the resolution is very, I don't think it's very sharp, but it's basically like, you know, you can use it mostly for the menu, but if you did need to monitor your shot with it, you could use it, but you wouldn't want to. The only time that the operator of the camera could use this LCD is if it's on sticks and you pretty much have a fixed shot, maybe at an event or something like that, you're not moving the camera around too much, or maybe you're moving it slightly. Otherwise it's totally useless for the operator of the camera. Number two, it's essentially an L mount camera like the 6K full frame, and that's fine. But they are also offering it in EF and PL mounts. I understand if you don't anticipate ever wanting to use L mount lenses with this camera, it makes sense to buy an EF or PL version. However, since it is designed around the L mount, mirrorless mount, there's no room, I would imagine there's no room for internal NDs. But on the pocket cameras, the pro version anyway, that was designed around the EF mount, they were, there's room for an ND system, the built-in NDs. If you buy the EF or the PL version of this camera, there's room for NDs, they didn't add them. I don't know why they wouldn't have like a, a pro version that's more money that has internal NDs. I'm sure there'll be one in the future. So it doesn't make any sense to buy this camera 
in either EF or PL without internal NDs. If it were me and I wanted to use EF or PL lenses, I would just buy the L-mount version and get a PL or EF adapter. Because you could probably find one of those that has an ND system built into it these days. So that's design decision number two. Not a huge one, but more just for your general information. Number three, the sensor. Now, I am not an expert and I don't have any definitive information, but it, my guess is that this is a variation of the sensor that was introduced back in 2018 with the Sony a7 III that's been used in a lot of different cameras in the intervening years, the Nikon Z6, Z6 II, Nikon ZF, Panasonic S1, S1H, S5, S5 II, S5 IIX, Pocket, Full Frame, and now the Pixis 6K. Why do I think it's that sensor? Resolution, around 24 megapixels is the same across all of those cameras. It has the same sort of high speed limitations as all of those cameras. So typically they can only shoot in like the full readout of the sensor up to around 30, 36 frames per second in the case of this one, but no real high frame rate options. If you want to go to 60, you're going to get a super 35 crop. Another similarity across all of these cameras is to go to 120 frames per second, you have to go to 1080p. So there's no 4K higher than 60 frames per second in any camera that uses what I believe to be a version of this same sensor. And they all have a very slow readout. That will be manifested obviously in the high frame rates that we've already talked about, but also in rolling shutter. So if you have fast moving objects going across the frame, they're gonna bend. If you pan the camera fast, you're gonna have uh, warpy, bendy, jello-y lines. All of these cameras suffer from these flaws, which is why I think they're all using a variation of that same sensor. That's why, coming back to my original point, this isn't a new camera. It is a, a new design, <laughs> it's got a new body, but in terms of its technology, in terms of its features, it's not offering anything new. This gets back to why I think the hype is just insane. Why would you want, why would you hype up a camera that's coming out in 2024 as if it's some sort of game-changing revolutionary camera when it's essentially using a sensor from six years ago? If you don't think it's using that same sensor, then feel free to hit me up in the comments, but also tell me why you think it's different. And if it is a new sensor, why isn't it offering anything new? Image quality wise, I'm sure it's fine. This is a good sensor. It's got a good dynamic range, good detail, 6K, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the advances in sensors in the last six years have been more to do with like their readout, like how fast they can be, or maybe in just like the overall resolution, more resolution and or faster readout. In terms of image quality, it's not really been much improvement in the last six years. So don't worry about that. I just want you to understand that you're really not getting anything new in terms of technology with this camera. The advantages obviously are internal B-RAW. And for a lot of people, that is pretty much all they need to know. <laughs> Other people are going to appreciate that it is a locked sensor, so there's no IBIS. Um, that might be advantageous for certain scenarios where you don't want that sensor moving around. The other advantage is that it has a built-in optical low-pass filter. And most of the other cameras that are using the sensor don't have an OLPF. And the advantage of that is it will typically reduce artifacts like moiré that you might get shooting certain types of patterns. The disadvantage of an OLPF is that it's gonna reduce sharpness. That could be seen as an advantage. A lot of people like a softer image when they're talking about cinematic footage, whatever. Just know that it's got an OPF. Most of the other hybrid style cameras that use this sensor don't have one. The S1H does. So that is another option. If you want the OPF and you like the sensor, then you could all, always opt for the S1H or the box version of that camera. I can't remember what that's called, the B1H or something like that. If you just search for box style S1H, you'll find it. Another thing to be aware of, since this is shooting B-RAW, you're typically not getting oversampled images. If you want a 4K readout of this sensor in this camera, that's gonna be a crop into the sensor, not 6K oversampled. If you do want to oversample, essentially what you have to do is shoot the full 6048 by 4032, three by two open gate, and then crop and reframe and oversample that in post. That's you know gonna give you a great result, but you can get oversampled 4K from the hybrid cameras, the S5s, the S1s, 
the Nikons, et cetera, et cetera. It is nice that Blackmagic Design finally came up with a battery or chose a battery solution that was sufficient or that is sufficient to power this camera for a reasonable time frame. So that's a, a definite plus. If this camera makes sense for you, if you like Blackmagic, if you like the workflow, be raw, and you want it all built in, great. Then this camera is gonna be fine. For a lot of people though, I think it makes this just as much sense to go with one of the hybrid cameras like the new Panasonics, older Panasonics, or the Nikons, etc. Especially if, you know, if if the raw workflow is important, you can get raw work. You can get a raw workflow on all of those cameras, whether that's ProRes RAW with an Atomos recorder or Blackmagic RAW with the Video Assist, which did get a price reduction alongside the announcement or the launch of this camera. A lot of people. You'll see on YouTube, they'll like, oh, I love the image. I love the look of the Blackmagic pocket cameras. I don't get it. A lot of that, I think, probably comes from 12-bit internal from B-RAW and also the lack of processing of the image. So there's no noise reduction being applied in camera. Uh, you know, lens corrections are bypassed, etc. If those things are important to you, the 12-bit RAW and the, the lack of processing, you can get that with the majority of these hybrid cameras with either ProRes or Blackmagic RAW over HDMI. You might not get all the flexibility and aspect ratios like open gate, depending on the camera. So you definitely have to do some research and, and really kind of decide which cameras are gonna suit your needs, but the options are out there. And this is also not a Blackmagic hate fest. I, I like Blackmagic design. I like DaVinci Resolve. I've owned Blackmagic cameras. I have the original Pocket. I used to have an Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K. I've been around this space since about 2015, 2016. Back then, these cameras, I think, offered a lot more value and were a lot more exciting because the hybrid cameras at the time were so much more limited in their internal recording. They only did 8-bit 420. That was a huge difference between 8-bit and 12-bit cinema DNG, 12-bit raw, B-raw, whatever the case was. Nowadays, basically every camera since 2020 uh, can shoot 10-bit 422 internally. Now, I know there's still a difference between 10-bit and 12-bit, but <laughs> the difference isn't that significant, I think, for a majority of work that's going online especially. You can do a ton with a 10-bit 422 image, even if it's H.265, H.264, long gop. Those highly compressed files still give you a ton of, of color information, a ton of latitude to push and pull that footage, to correct it if you messed up your white balance, if you messed up your exposure. Yeah, it's not raw, I'm not trying to say it is, but it's still super flexible, way better than cameras that were limited to 8-bit 420. The difference to me isn't that significant. And if you want it, you can get it with an external recorder. Now, if this camera had a LCD screen that was usable <laughs> for the actual camera operator, then yeah, that would be an advantage. You could be like, well, I've got it all in here. I don't need an external recorder. I don't need that extra cabling. I don't need batteries, the extra cost and the rigging, et cetera, to get that. It's built into the camera. But this camera needs an external monitor. So it needs all that shit just to be a usable camera 99% of the time. With that being the case, you know, your hybrid mirrorless camera to get raw is going to be the same thing. You need a cage, you need a monitor arm, you need a cable, you need batteries for the recorder. In my opinion, their, their low-end cameras aren't offering enough <laughs> to, to overcome their, their crazy limitations, their crazy design decisions, or their crazy cost-cutting measures. But I just think there's so many other options out there. And nowadays, as good as autofocus is getting, you know, this camera is, is not gonna have any continuous autofocus. It's just so good, like especially in Sony and Canon. I mean, that's definitely a feature that I think, in my opinion, if it's good like Sony, especially, that's game changing, that's revolutionary, that changes the way that you can actually use these cameras and the things that you can do as a solo operator. Having continuous tracking autofocus is way more important uh, and can, allow you to do things that you couldn't do way more than the 12-bit B-RAW does in these cameras. Okay, so to wrap up, the camera is fine. If it suits your needs, get it, but I just don't want you to be sucked into the hype. And some of the hype is, is crazy. And maybe it is just the thumbnails and the titles just to get people to click. But things like 
you know, selling my Komodo X or selling my FX6 for the Pixis. That's stupid. If you've bought those cameras or you've financed those cameras and they haven't paid for themselves and they haven't made you any money, then that's fine. Sell them, get a much cheaper camera. That makes sense. But in terms of just the, the capabilities, it makes absolutely zero sense to sell a Komodo or a Komodo X to get this Pixis. Because the Komodo sensor, does have a technological advantage. It's got a it's got a global shutter, and to me, that's a it's a way more impressive uh, advantage or, or feature than the capabilities of this Pixis. Even if it's full frame, like I would imagine that the Komodo and especially the Komodo X sensor probably gives you better dynamic range than the Pixis does. And I also would be willing to bet that the Red Code raw footage or codec is better than B raw. So again doesn't make any sense to sell a Komodo <laughs> to get a Pixis. The FX6, the limitations of that, it's, a, it's 10 bit 422, so there's no raw internal on the FX6, and the external raw is, is kind of weirdly limited on that camera. So there's an advantage for the Pixis. The advantages of the FX6, well, the form factor is way more usable, I think, right out of the box. The LCD is <laughs> movable, positionable in a lot of ways, and the readout of the sensor is way faster on the FX6, so it's not global shutter by any means, but it's much, much better than the Pixis. Continuous autofocusing, again, I think that's an, an insane advantage and something that really changes how you can work with a camera as a solo operator. And lastly, it's got internal variable NDs. So I don't know, why would you sell your FX6 for this? You'd be silly to do so. Anyway, this is my two cents. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think. See you later.